introduce the Vice Chancellor, Professor Alison Richard, who will introduce our guest speaker. Well, good afternoon to you all. Uh, before uh, introducing our guest speaker, let me just say on this the occasion of the fifth uh, uh, annual lecture uh, in honour of Sir David Williams that uh, as, the, uh, by, as the weeks and the months go by, uh, my uh, admiration and respect for Sir David Williams, which was high in the first place, just goes up and up and up. This man, uh, in addition to be a, being a distinguished uh, legal scholar, uh, blazed a trail for uh, vice chancellors who would come after him, for which uh, we are eternally grateful, David. So, so thank you on, on this uh, celebratory occasion. Um, and now it is my pleasure and my privilege, my great privilege, to introduce uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who was educated at Cornell, Harvard, and then at Columbia, where she uh, received her LLB. She was a uh, professor of law at Rutgers University and then at Columbia between 1963 and 1980. In 1971, she was instrumental in launching the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU and served as the general counsel of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, for seven years. She was appointed judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia in 1980, and then in 1993, President Clinton nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, where she has served since then uh, with distinction, a distinguished leader of uh, the United States, a distinguished leader for the world. I would just like to add a very brief story as a footnote to the introduction of an enormously distinguished person uh, and to make two points in my story, one for the students, one for everyone. Uh, I had a very, very uh, bright, one of the brightest and finest graduate students I ever had, who did his PhD on baboon behavior in East Africa. And he went on to a distinguished career as an anthropologist. And then he came back to visit me at Yale one day and he said, you know, I think that I know everything I want to know about baboons in one lifetime. And I think I'm going to do something else now. And he went off to law school and I followed him through the years. And in the course of his career, he clerked once for uh, Justice Ginsburg. And then I gather, again, worked with her and what I know about Justice Ginsburg from this former student of baboons of mine is that this, that this is just one of the most wonderful teachers and finest human beings, in addition to being one of the most distinguished legal scholars and leaders in the country and the world. That's what I know. Uh, and what I say to you students is, is this. I don't know what you all may be studying now, but you could study anything, and you can be what you want to be, as, as David Post was many years ago. And I say to the room at large that it is just a very fine thing to be both so distinguished, such a leader, and yet, and yet, all the way along, a great teacher and someone who inspires generations to come. And with that... Let me say again that it is both my privilege and my honour, as well as my pleasure, to welcome you here and to uh, invite you to take the, the podium. I thank the Vice Chancellor so very much for coming here to introduce, introduce me, it is a special honor. Well, in any season, it would be an honor to speak as Sir David Williams' lecturer. But no season could be better for me than this one for my daughter, Jane Ginsburg, is here at Cambridge. She is thriving in her year as the Arthur Goodhart visiting chair and thoroughly enjoying her affiliation 
with the law faculty and Emmanuel College, Sir David's College, also John Harvard's. I did not know it at the time, but Sir David and I attended Harvard Law School the same school year, 1957 to 1958. He came east from graduate studies at the University of California in Berkeley to complete his Harkness Fellowship at Cambridge across the sea. He was in a graduate program. I was a lowly 2L. Sir David has done so much good in his various occupations as leading scholar and author in the fields of administrative and constitutional law, as lecturer around the world, true public citizen serving on many important commissions and councils, vice chancellor of this great university for seven years. Several of my colleagues have benefited from their association with him, Charles Wright, Frank Rosencraft, and Malcolm Wilkie. They were all fellows at Wolfson when Sir David was president of that college. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy participated with Sir David in the Anglo-American Legal Exchange. And we have a few more shared connections both Sir David and I are members of the American Law Institute and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I just discovered honorary members of Lincoln's Inn. When Sir David spoke at the American Law Institute's annual dinner 15 years ago, the then president of the Institute, Rod Perkins, did some homework to prepare his introduction. Rod told us that Sir David grew up in West Wales in a pre-Roman town that is not only his birthplace, but it's also believed to be the birthplace of Merlin, renowned magician at King Arthur's court. As an attendee at that 1990 event, I can tell you that even after a convivial cocktail hour and wine of acceptable quality flowing freely at dinner, Sir David's talk captivated the audience. I selected as the subject of this evening's remarks uh, something that was prompted by his parting words at the ALI gathering. Sir David celebrated our joint Anglo-American heritage. He said he was convinced jurists in Europe and especially in the United Kingdom must take account of experience in the United States over two centuries and now more since our separation from the mother country. I will turn the table round and speak of growing appreciation in the United States among United States judges and lawyers that we must take account of experience, good thinking, and judicial opinions beyond our borders. The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy famously instructs, justice, justice, you shall pursue, that you may thrive. My remarks center on one aspect of that pursuit in the system in which I work, judicial review for constitutionality as it is practiced in the United States, what impact, if any, should international and foreign opinions have on decision-making in U.S. courts? It has proved to be a controversial topic. Recognizing the controversy, I will endeavor to explain my view, which is simply this. If United States experience and decisions can be instructive to systems that have more recently instituted or invigorated judicial review for constitutionality, so we can learn from others now engaged in measuring ordinary laws and executive actions against charters securing basic rights. 
exposing laws to judicial review for constitutionality was once uncommon outside the United States. In the United Kingdom, which is not distant from France, Spain, Germany, and other civil law countries in this regard, court review of legislation for compatibility with a fundamental charter was considered off-limits, irreconcilable with the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy. But particularly in the years since World War II, many nations installed constitutional review by courts as one safeguard against oppressive governments and stirred up majorities. National, multinational, and international human rights charters and courts today play a prominent part in our world. The U.S. judicial system will be the poorer, I believe, if we do not both share our, our experience with and learn from other systems, systems with values and commitments to democracy similar to our own. Very much the same opinion was several times expressed by the Chief Justice of the United States, William H. Rehnquist, who put it this way in a 1999 forward to a collection of essays on comparative constitutional law. For nearly a century and a half, the Chief Justice said, courts in the United States exercising the power of judicial review for constitutionality had no precedent to turn to except their own because our court alone exercised this sort of authority. When many new constitutional courts were created after the Second World War, these courts naturally looked to decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States, among other sources, for developing their own law. But now that constitutional law is solidly grounded in so many countries, it is time the U.S. courts began looking to the decisions of other constitutional courts to aid in their own deliberative process. Of late, I must acknowledge, my chief has expressed skepticism, if not downright disagreement, on the relevance of foreign law, both on human rights issues and on federalism questions, issues implicating the allocation of regulatory and decision-making authority between states of the United States and the nation. I will later refer to 21st century dissenting opinions the Chief joined criticizing comparative side glances by the Court's majority. Returning to my own perspective, while U.S. jurisprudence has evolved over the course of two centuries of constitutional adjudication, we are not so wise that we have nothing to learn from other democratic legal systems newer to judicial review for constitutionality. The point was well made by Judge Guido Calabresi, former dean of Yale Law School and now a judge on the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, one of 13 appellate courts in the United States federal system. Wise parents, Judge Calabresi said in a 1995 concurring opinion, do not hesitate to learn from their children. In the value I place on comparative dialogue, on sharing with and learning from others, I am inspired by counsel from the founders of the United States the drafters and signers of the Declaration of Independence cared about the opinions of other people. They placed before the world the reasons why the states joining together to become the United States of America were impelled to separate from Great Britain. The declarants stated their reasons out of a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. And I should add, even in this audience, the Declaration then endeavored through a long list of grievances to submit the facts, the long train of the British Crown's abuses,
to the scrutiny of a candid world. The U.S. Supreme Court early on expressed a complementary view. The judicial power of the United States, the court said in 1816, was intended to include cases in the correct adjudication of which foreign nations are deeply interested and in which the principles of the law and comedy of nations often form an essential inquiry. Far from exhibiting hostility to foreign countries' views in laws, Professor Vicki Jackson of the Georgetown University Law Faculty wrote last year, the founding generation showed concern for how adjudication in our courts would affect other countries' regard for the United States. Even more so today, the United States is subject to the scrutiny of a candid world. What the United States does, for good or for ill, continues to be watched by the international community in particular. Um, what we are doing in this troubled world in face of a terrorist threat. John Jay, George Washington's appointee as first Chief Justice of the United States, wrote in 1793 that the United States, by taking a place among the nations of the earth, had become amenable to the laws of nations, what we call today international law. Eleven years later, the great Chief Justice, John Marshall, who no doubt read Blackstone on this matter, cautioned that an act of Congress ought never to be construed to violate the law of nations if any other possible construction remains. And in 1900, the court famously reaffirmed in the Paquet de Habana that international law is part of our law and must be ascertained and administered by the courts of justice where there is no treaty and no controlling executive or legislative act or judicial decision, resort must be had to the customs and usages of civilized nations. There is a generations old and still persistent discordant view, I acknowledge, on recourse to the opinions of mankind. A mid-19th century U.S. Chief Justice expressed opposition to such recourse in a rather extreme statement. He wrote, no one, we presume, supposes that any change in public opinion or feeling in the civilized nations of Europe should induce the United States Supreme Court to give to the words of the Constitution a more liberal construction than they were intended to bear when the instrument was framed and adopted. Those words were penned in 1857. They appear in Chief Justice Roger Tawney's opinion for a divided court in Dred Scott v. Sanford, an opinion that invoked the majestic due process clause to uphold one human's right to hold another in bondage. The Dred Scott decision declared that no descendant of Africans imported into the United States and sold as a slave could ever become a citizen of the United States. While the U.S. Civil, law, Civil War and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution reversed the Dred Scott judgment, U.S. jurors and political actors today are hardly of one mind on the propriety of looking beyond our nation's borders, particularly on matters touching fundamental human rights. Some have expressed spirited opposition. Justice Scalia wrote this year, the court should cease putting forth foreigners' views as part of the reason basis of its decisions. To invoke alien law when it agrees with one, one's own thinking and ignore it otherwise is not reasoned decision-making, but sophistry. Another trenchant cri critic, Seventh Circuit Judge Richard Posner, commented last year, 
To cite foreign law as authority is to flirt with the discredited idea of a universal natural law, or to suppose fantastically that the world's judges constitute a single elite community of wisdom and conscience. Judge Posner's view rests in part on the concern that U.S. judges do not comprehend the social, historical, political, and institutional background from which foreign opinions emerge. Nor do we even understand the language in which laws and judgments outside the common law realm are written. Judge Posner is right, of course, to this extent. Foreign opinions are not authoritative. They set no binding precedent for the U.S. judge, but they can add to the store of knowledge relevant to the solution of trying questions. As to our ignorance of foreign legal systems, just as lawyers can learn from each other in multinational transactions and bar associations, judges too can profit from exchanges and associations with jurists elsewhere. Yes, we should approach foreign legal materials with sensitivity to our differences, our deficiencies, our imperfect understanding, but imperfection, I believe, should not lead us to abandon the effort to learn what we can from the experience and good thinking foreign sources may convey. Somewhat more accommodating, Ninth Circuit Judge O'Scanlan stated in remarks he made last fall at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London, limited references to foreign legal authorities may play a beneficial role in contemporary American jurisprudence, but, he continued, courts in the United States should restrict use of foreign legal authorities to certain well-defined categories of cases when treaties or international conventions are relevant, first and foremost, and also when Congress has expressed a desire to bring the United States into alignment with the international community. Judge O'Scanlan gave as examples of proper use of foreign decisions two opinions I wrote for the court, I was surprised to find. The first, El Al Israel Airlines against Tseng, relied on a House of Lords decision interpreting the Warsaw Convention's limitations on airline liability for injury to a passenger, and the second, Eldred against Ashcroft, upheld against constitutional challenge, a statute conforming the U.S. copyright term to the European Union's life plus 70 years. But overall, Judge O'Scanlan's presentation put him in line with Fourth Circuit Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson, who cautioned against looking abroad when resolving contentious social issues. More representative of the perspective I share, and I'm pleased to say I do with five of my colleagues, Patricia M. Wall, the former Chief Judge of the D.C. Circuit, last year said with characteristic wisdom, it's hard for me to see that the use of foreign decisional law is an up or down proposition. I see it rather as a pool of potential and useful information and thought that must be mined, although with caution and restraint. Many current members of the U.S. Congress would terminate all debate over whether federal courts should refer to foreign or international legal materials. For the most part, they would re reply with a resounding no. Two identical resolutions introduced this year, one in the U.S. House of Representatives, the other in the Senate, declare that judicial interpretations regarding the meaning of the Constitution of the United States should not be based on judgments, laws, or pronouncements of foreign institutions unless such materials inform an understanding of the original meaning of the Constitution. The House of Representatives has so far 
um, attracted 54 co-sponsors for that resolution. Two 2005 proposed acts would do more than resolve. They would positively prohibit federal courts when interpreting the U.S. Constitution from relying on any law policy or other action of a foreign state or international organization other than the English constitutional and common law up to the time of the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Even reference to a Scottish verdict, it seems, would be out of order. These measures recycle similar resolutions and bills proposed before the 2004 election in the United States, but never put to a vote. Although I doubt the current measures will garner sufficient support to pass, it is disquieting that they have attracted sizable support. And one not so small concern, they fuel the irrational fringe. A recent example, the U.S. Supreme Court's marshal alerted Justice O'Connor and me to a February 28, 2005 posting, web posting on a chat site. It opened. Okay, commandos, here is your first patriotic assignment, an easy one. Supreme Court Justices Ginsburg and O'Connor have publicly stated that they use European laws and rulings to decide how to rule on American cases. This is a huge threat to our republic and constitutional freedom. If you are what you say you are, a true patriot and not an armchair patriot, then these two justices will not live another week. More than two months have passed. <laughs> Justice O'Connor, I am happy to report, remains alive and well, and as for me, you can judge for yourself. To a large extent, I believe the critics in Congress and the media misperceive how and why U.S. courts refer to foreign and international court decisions. The Washington Post, for example, worried in a March 25th editorial about the implications for liberty and the democratic rights of the American people if the courts outsource America's constitutional tradition. We refer to decisions rendered abroad at best repet repetition, not because they are binding, controlling authorities, but for their indication in Judge Wald's words of common denominators of basic fairness governing relationships between the governors and the governed. Professor Vicki Jackson noted a point critics of comparative side glances perhaps overlook, and that is the negative authority foreign experience may sometimes have. She referred particularly to the steel seizure case there, Justice Jackson, in his separate opinion, pointed to features of the Weimar Constitution in Germany that allowed Adolf Hitler to assume dictatorial powers. He contrasted Germany's situation with that of France and Great Britain, countries in which legislative authorization was required before the exercise of emergency powers by the executive. Justice Jackson drew from that comparison support for the conclusion that without more specific congressional authorization, the U.S. president could not seize private property even in aid of a war effort. The U.S. Constitution, Justice Scalia has noted, does not contain any instruction resembling South Africa's prescription. That nation's constitution provides that courts when interpreting the Bill of Rights, must consider international law and may consider foreign <coughs> law. Other post-World War II constitutions, India's and Spain's, for example, have similar prescriptions. I would demur to Justice Scalia's observation 
Judges in the United States are free to consult all manner of commentary, restatement, treatises, what law professors and law students write copiously in law reviews. If we can consult those writings, why not the analysis of a question similar to, to one we confront, contained in, a, in an opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, the German Constitutional Court, or the European Court of Human Rights? A case in point, one well known to this audience. On December 16, 2004, in a controversy precipitated by the fight against terrorism, the Lords of Appeal issued a way-paving decision, one that looked beyond the United Kingdom's borders. <coughs> the case was brought by aliens held in custody in Belmarsh Prison. A nine-member panel ruled eight to one that the British government's indefinite detention of foreigners suspected of terrorism without charges, without trial, is incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights incorporated into domestic law by the UK Human Rights Act. Lord Bingham's lead opinion draws not only on domestic decisions and decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, it also refers to opinions of the Supreme Court of Canada and US Federal Court opinions, finding the differential treatment of nationals and non-nationals impermissible under the Human Rights Act. Lord Bingham also referred to several UN instruments, commencing with the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and including the 1965 International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Other opinions, too, in that noteworthy decision contain comparative references. One example, Baroness Hale, after noting that Belmarsh is not the British Guantanamo Bay, quoted a passage on the protection of minority rights from Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address. Lord Bingham, B Bingham did make this observation gently that contemporary United States authority does not provide evidence of general international practice. That comment may have figured in the New York Times characterization of the Lord's ruling as a strong example of the increasing interdependence of domestic and international law, at least outside the United States. United States District Judge Lewis Pollack, a former dean of Yale Law School and later of the University of Pennsylvania School of Law, in a February 2005 address at the Inner Temple, called the Belmarsh decision masterful. The law lords, he said, spoke in a firmer voice than the U.S. Supreme Court has up to now on the detention of alleged terrorists without charges or trial. The notion that it is improper to look beyond the borders of the United States in grappling with hard questions I earlier suggested, has a close kinship to the view of the United States Constitution as a document essentially frozen in time as of the date of its ratification. I am not a partisan of that view. U.S. jurists honor the framers' intent to create a more perfect union, I believe, if they read the Constitution as belo belonging to a global 21st century and not as fixed forever in 18th century understandings. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes made the point felicitously in a case decided in 1920, Missouri against Holland, involving the treaty-making power. When we are dealing with words in the Constitution of the United States, Holmes wrote, we must realize that they have called into life a being, the development of which could not have been foreseen completely by the most gifted of its begetters. The case before us must be considered in the light of our whole experience and not merely in that 
of what was said a hundred years ago. A key 1958 opinion, Trope Against Dulles, sounds that same theme. At issue in that case, whether stripping a wartime deserter of citizenship violated the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. The basic concept underlying the amendment, the opinion states, is nothing less than the dignity of man. Therefore, the constitutional text must draw its meaning from the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. In that regard, the plurality reported, the civilized nations of the world are in virtual unanimity that statelessness is not to be imposed as a punishment for crime. A fairly recent example of the frozen in time interpretation is a case called Grupo Mexicano v. Alliance Bond Fund. It was a 1999 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. It involved no grand constitutional question, simply equity between parties with no ideological score to settle. The basic scenario, a Mexican company defaulted on payments due to a U.S. creditor and was sued in a federal district court that had personal jurisdiction over the debtor. Sliding into insolvency, the Mexican company was busily distributing what remained of its assets to its Mexican creditors. It did so in clear violation of a contractual promise to treat the U.S. creditor on a par with all other unsecured creditors. Continue, continuation of that activity would have left nothing in the till for the U.S. creditor. Since 1975, British courts have been providing a remedy in similar circumstances to assure that there would be assets against which a final judgment for the plaintiff creditor could be executed. Courts in this country issue Moreva injunctions named after a decision of the Court of Appeal by Lord Denning approving the practice. A Moreva injunction temporarily restrains a foreign debtor from transferring assets pending adjudication of the domestic creditor's claim. A U.S. District Court judge ruling over two decades after the leading U.K. decisions looked to the Moreva injunction, which other common law nations had by then adopted, and found it altogether fitting for the U.S. creditor's case against the Mexican debtor. The Court of Appeals agreed, but a five to four majority of the U.S. Supreme Court concluded that Moreva injunctions were not traditionally accorded by courts of equity at the time the Constitution was adopted, <laughs> a power that English courts of equity did not actually exercise until 1975, the court concluded, was not one U.S. courts could assume without congressional authorization. Joined by Justices Stephen Souter and Breyer, I dissented from the court's static conception of equitable remedial authority. Earlier decisions had described that authority as supple, adaptable to changing conditions. I noted, among other things, that federal courts in their sometimes heroic efforts to implement the public school desegregation mandated by Brown against Board of Education did not embrace a frozen in time view of their equitable authority, issuing degree, decrees beyond the contemplation of the 18th century chancellor. They, they applied the enduring principles of equity to the changing needs of a society still in the process of achieving a more perfect union. Turning from frozen in time interpretation, I will take up another shortfall or insularity in current U.S. jurisprudence, at least as I see it. The Bill of Rights, few would disagree, is the hallmark and pride of the United States. And one might therefore assume that it guides and controls U.S. officialdom wherever in the world they carry the flag of the United States or their credentials. 
but that is not the currently prevailing view. For example, absent an express ban by treaty, a U.S. officer may abduct a foreigner and forcibly transport him to the United States to stand trial. The Supreme Court so held 6 to 3 in 1992. Just a year earlier, South Africa's Supreme Court of Appeal had ruled the other way. It determined that under South Africa's common law, a trial, a trial court would have no jurisdiction to hear a case against a defendant when the state had acted lawlessly in apprehending him by participating in an abduction across international borders. Another example, one in which I was a participant involving civil litigation. Interpreting the United States Supreme Court precedent, a divided D.C. Court of Appeals held in 1989 during my tenure on the court that foreign plaintiffs acting abroad the plaintiffs were Indian family planning organizations, had no First Amendment rights and therefore no standing to assert a violation of such rights by U.S. officials. In particular, the Indian organizations complained of a condition that the United States placed on grant money. The recipients of U.S. dollars could not engage in any abortion counseling, even in a separate entity with funds from other sources. In dissent, I resisted the notion that in an encounter between the United States and non-resident aliens, the amendment that we prize as first has no force in court. I expressed the expectation that the position taken in the restatement third of foreign relations would one day accurately describe our law. <coughs> Wherever the United States acts, the restatement projects, it can only act in accordance with the limitations imposed by the Constitution. Returning to my main theme, I will quickly recount chronologically the Supreme Court's most recent decisions involving foreign or international legal sources as an aid to the resolution of constitutional questions. In a headline 2002 decision, Atkins against Virginia, a six-member majority, all save the, save the Chief Justice, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, held unconstitutional the execution of a mentally retarded offender. The court noted that within the world community, the imposition of the death penalty for crimes committed by mentally retarded offenders is overwhelmingly disapproved. The following term was appraised as path marking. New York Times reporter Linda Greenhouse observed in July 2003 in her annual roundup of Supreme Court decisions, the court has displayed a steadily growing attentiveness to legal developments in the rest of the world and to the court's role in keeping the United States in step with them. Among examples, I would include the Michigan University Affirmative Action cases decided in June 2003. In separate opinions, I look to two United Nations conventions, the 1965 International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which the United States has ratified, and the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which, sadly, the United States has not yet ratified. Both conventions distinguish between impermissible policies of oppression or exclusion and permissible policies of inclusion, temporary special measures aimed at accelerating de facto equality. The court's decision in the Michigan Law School case, I said, accords with the international understanding of the purpose and propriety of affirmative action. A better indicator from that same term, because it attracted a majority, 
is Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court in Lawrence against Texas, announced in June 2003, overruling the Supreme Court's 1986 decision in Bowers against Hardwick, Lawrence declared unconstitutional a Texas statute prohibiting two adult persons of the same sex from engaging voluntarily in intimate sexual conduct. On the question of dynamic versus static interpretation, the court's opinion instructs, had those who drew and ratified the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment known the components of liberty in its manifold possibilities, they might have been more specific. They did not presume to have this insight. They knew time can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper, in fact, serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. On respect for the opinions of humankind, the Lawrence Court emphasized, the right the petitioners seek in this case has been accepted as an integral part of human freedom in many other countries. In support, the court cited the leading 1981 European Court of Human Rights decision, Dudgeon against United Kingdom, and subsequent European Human Rights Court decisions affirming the protected right of homosexual adults to engage in intimate consensual conduct. In the 2003 to 2004 term, foreign and international legal sources figured in several decisions. These include most notably two June 2004 decisions, one Hamdi against Rumsfeld, concerned a U.S. citizen held incommunicado in a Navy brig in South Carolina pursuant to an ex executive decree declaring him an enemy combatant. Ruling some six months before the Lord's decision in the Belmarsh case, the U.S. Supreme Court held eight to one that the petitioner was entitled at least to a fair opportunity to contest the factual basis for his detention. Even in our most challenging and uncertain moments, when our nation's commitment to due process is most severely tested, Justice O'Connor wrote for a four-justice plurality, we must preserve our commitment at home to the principles for which we fight abroad. History and common sense, she reminded, teach us that an unchecked system of detention carries the potential to become a means of oppression and abuse. That point received eloquent statement in Lord Hoffman's opinion in the Belmarsh case. The other enemy combatant case, Rasul against Bush, held that U.S. courts have jurisdiction to consider challenges to the legality of the detention of foreign nationals captured in hostilities abroad and then transported to the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Lord Stein, before this decision, had called Guantanamo a legal black hole. The Supreme Court has so far written only Chapter 1 on the Guantanamo Bay incarcerations. Federal District Court judges have split on Chapter 2. One judge held that foreigners detained at Guantanamo Bay, though they have access to court, could gain no judicial relief. Another ruled that the detainees were entitled to a full and fair hearing on the question whether their incarceration meets due process demands. Both cases are currently on appeal. The Supreme Court's March 2005 decision in Roper against Simmons presented perhaps the fullest expression to date on the propriety of looking to the opinions of humankind, holding unconstitutional the execution of persons under the age of 18 when they committed capital crimes. The court declared it fitting to acknowledge the overwhelming weight of international opinion against the juvenile death penalty, 
Justice Kennedy wrote for the court that the opinion of the world community provides respected and significant confirmation of our conclusions. It does not lessen our fidelity to the U.S. Constitution, he explained, to recognize the express affirmation of certain fundamental rights by other nations and peoples. The Roper opinion pointed specifically to the United Kingdom's abolition of the juvenile death penalty over 50 years ago. The UK's experience bears particular rele relevance, Justice Kennedy noted, in light of the historic ties between our countries and the Eighth Amendment's own origins in the English Declaration of Rights of 1689. Justice O'Connor, although she dissented from the court's categorical ruling, agreed with the court on the relevance of foreign and international law to an assessment of evolving standards of decency. The other dissenters, dissenters for whom Justice Scalia spoke vigorously contended that foreign and international law have no place in determining what punishments are cruel and unusual within the meaning of the U.S. Constitution's Eighth Amendment. Recognizing that forecasts are risky, I nonetheless believe that we will continue to accord a decent respect to the opinions of humankind as a matter of comedy and in a spirit of humility. Comedy because projects vital to our well-being, combating international terrorism, is perhaps a prime example, require trust and cooperation among nations the world over, and humility, because in Justice O'Connor's words, other legal systems continue to innovate, to experiment, to find new solutions to the new legal problems that arise each day from which we can learn and benefit. In this regard, I was impressed by an observation made in September 2003 by Israel's Chief Justice Aharon Barak. September 11th, he noted, confronts the United States with the dilemma of conducting a war on terrorism without sacrificing the nation's most cherished values, including our, our respect for human dignity. We in Israel, Barak said, have our September 11 and September 12 and so on. He spoke of his own court's efforts to balance the government's no doubt compelling need to secure the safety of the state and of its citizens on the one hand and the nation's high regard for human dignity and freedom on the other hand. He referred particularly to a question presented to his court, is it lawful to use violence, less euphemistically, torture, in interrogating a terrorist in a ticking bomb situation. His court's answer, no, never use violence. He elaborated, it is the fate of a democracy that not all means are acceptable to it. Not all methods employed by its enemies are open to it. Sometimes a democracy must fight with one hand tied behind its back. Nonetheless, it has the upper hand. Preserving the rule of law and recognition of individual liberties constitute an important component of a democracy's understanding of security. At the end of the day, those values buoy up its spirit and strength and its capacity to overcome the difficulties. Lord Hoffman spoke to the same effect in his December 16, 2004 opinion. He concluded, the real threat to the life of the nation in the sense of a people living in accordance with its traditional laws and political values comes not from terrorism, but from laws such as Section 23 of the 2001 Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act authorizing indefinite imprisonment without charge or trial. That is the true measure of what terrorism may achieve. 
He hoped after the laws of appeal ruling, Parliament would not give the terrorists such a victory. Parliament, you no doubt know, reacted to the Lord's decisions by enacting in March a measure allowing placement of terrorist suspects under a highly restrictive form of house arrest in lieu of imprisonment, again, without charging or trying them. We live in an age in which the fundamental principles to which we sus subscribe, liberty, equality, and justice for all, are encountering extraordinary challenges. But it is also an age in which we can join hands with others who hold to those principles and face similar challenges. May we draw inspiration from Abigail Adams, who wrote to her son, the future president of the United States, of the era in which he was coming of age. These are the times in which a genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed. The habits of a vigorous mind are formed in contending with difficulties. Thank you for being such patient listeners.